Our speaker today is Georg Essel, and he will talk about top topology in digital sound synthesis. Take it away. All right. Well, thank you uh, so much for the kind of invitation and the opportunity to speak. Uh, so I'm going to talk about topology and digital sound synthesis. And I'm aware that um, uh, most of you probably, you know, you, you've experienced digital sound synthesis, but it's not something that you work in. So I, I hope I prepared this in a way that it is accessible. But if you're confused, you know, please, please do ask questions. Um, and I thought I'm going to start off with a pre-digital example. Right. So you see three different shapes of trumpets here. And uh, it turns out, you know, if you give me just a little bit of leeway, that we can sort of argue that these actually have an equivalence class between them uh, that says that they sound the same. Right. Uh, but clearly, you know, just on the paper, they are different geometric objects. Right. Um, it turns out that these bends here. Uh, do not fundamentally change the way these trumpets sound. Like we call this a waveguide phenomena. So air uh, pressure waves will be guided around these bands and they can actually be fairly narrow. And this and it allows us to reconfigure things quite drastically uh, while maintaining the same sound. Um, what happens a lot in applied domains is that we have an implied topolog topological phenomena going on that we actually don't study because it's our nicest simplification. We don't have to worry about it. Like these trumpets all sound the same. Why worry about the fine detail of this curvature when that's not a problem? Like I can actually make this trumpet and it will just sound just as nice as this. And it allows me to solve problems. Like this is a cornet, a very compact trumpet that I can play in one hand. I can pack a valve system on top. I can do a lot of things that is enabled by this kind of flexibility that's uh, a, a part of the underlying physics. Um, and so there's actually no real literature about uh, the topology of this, right? But I, I'm going to try to argue it's there. And in fact, in a way, the way it's going to turn out, like if this bend is too sharp or you actually have sharp edges, you're going to get scattering phenomena. And the scattering phenomena are the things that are going to change your underlying topology. So really this sort of, if you want to call this some scientific word, this isospectrality, come on. Uh -huh, for some reason, it doesn't. OK. Um, all right, I'm going to move on. For some reason, my pen is acting up. <laughs> this isospectrality um, uh, is something that's just convenient to use. and it, But it turns out there's a topological reason for it. Um, just to understand digital audio, um, we have sort of physical constraints uh, which are in effect. Like I'm giving this talk right now, and the way you're actually hearing my talk is through some loudspeaker and through some propagation through air. So audio is a time domain signal. And let me try the pen again. Hopefully this time it's going to be nice to me. But here we go. It's a time domain signal. And um, that's necessary. Like that's literally part of this presentation right now. But the second phenomenon that's going on that's relevant is that uh, it turns out that our ears are actually um, a, a kind of Fourier analyzer. Um, and so what we see over here is actually a, a, a Fourier representation. So we have now a frequency domain. And in that frequency domain, sinusoidal oscillations like this show up just as a frequency as an amplitude over here. And in this picture, you actually get sort of a sparse representation. You just have a few of these peaks here. And it turns out that actually a lot of phenomena have this sparsity. So, you know, you could speculate maybe our ear is a Fourier analyzer precisely because it's sort of a nicer representation to pick apart audio and uh, and we can interpret it more easily. Um, but this is sort of my one slide introduction to digital audio. And I mostly want to talk about, about the topology and about sound. So let's try to get there. Now, this is in pre-high school math, right? We all know that the sinusoid is a, a circle function and you can think of it in the um, complex domain as a, as a, a complex exponential and there's a projection out of that. Uh, but ultimately it's a sort of a time indexed, a time domain function over here. And um, because, uh, you know, in, in digital audio, we are aware that we hear oscillations um, a lot of uh, uh, algorithms are actually developed sort of 
starting from an oscillatory idea. So there are sort of variations of oscillatory functions over time. And for some reason, I have performance issues here, but it's okay. Um, but how can we think about this more topologically? Right. So the, the first step here is we're going to, instead of thinking of a time parameterized function, we're going to think of a dynamical system on the circle. Um, these maps are called circle maps. Oh my God, the pen. I don't know why this is going happening. Okay. So this is going to make my life difficult. Anyway, these are called circle maps. And they are just uh, discrete iterations from positions of the circle to positions of the circle. So we have them just discreetly indexed here. And you can see like the length here is not the same. So this can be some arbitrary function on the circle. And our domain is just, we have to stay on the circle. And these are just different ways to notate, you know, topologically that these are our circles. And in fact, down here, hopefully I can write this now. Uh, maybe it's, uh, Better to think of this R as R. Okay, come on. Jack, I somehow have yeah. the feeling that when you're writing on the right side of the screen, it doesn't work, and the rest of the screen would work. Oh, I see. I have no idea why this should be. The I case. have no idea either this. why this is happening. I was rehearsing this, and it was working, so I don't know what has happened. But thank you for the for the insight. So I'm gonna uh, go with that. So now it's gonna my arrangement here is unfortunately. Um, this thing, yeah, so for some reason I cannot write in certain areas. Okay, um, this interval here, you should sort of algorithmically think of it as being mod one arithmetic, right? So if we overshoot, we're gonna fall back down on the other side, the bottom side, if we undershoot, we fall back down on top and it sort of gives you a, a, an arithmetic on the circle. Um, and um, let me just keep going. Okay, so, this idea of studying uh, dynamical systems that way is old. Uh, a particularly important paper here is by Arnold in the 60s. And he was interested in stability. He wanted to understand stability of nonlinear coupling systems. And he was studying this uh, map that you see here that uh, I, I like to call the sine circle map. Because uh, the, the, the first part here, this here, is just a, a standard sinusoidal oscillator. We, we step around the circle with constant offsets that will give you a sinusoid if you project it out. And there's a nonlinear part here that's a sinusoidal perturbation, if you will, uh, of this uh, linear oscillator. And this H here is the strength. And in this diagram that's actually out of Arnold's paper, that would be epsilon over two pi. Uh, and in fact, in his paper, he does two pi here and we have to rescale things, uh, but it doesn't matter, right? So this is uh, this is the general phenomena. I just like to use these contents because they allow me to to use sort of unit intervals and, and so forth. Um, but the idea is general, right? You can take any map uh, from the circle to itself. Uh, but before I show that, let me just show this. So this is actually Arnold's circle map and the green line just connect successive points in the map. So I can do different degrees of nonlinearity. And you can see how uh, the, the way the lines connect depend on where you are in the circle. So this is a nonlinear oscillator um, as studied by Arnold. Um, just one thing before I keep moving. So these areas up here, they're now called Arnold tanks and they're um, regions of, of stable periods. So they're, they're, they're stability regions. Uh, we call them mode locking in, in our field. Uh, and that's what Arnold was interested in. But from a Muslim perspective, the reason why we don't care about the shape of the trumpet is the same reason why we don't care about the shape of this. This doesn't sound different. This is not interesting to hear, right? This, all these things sound the same, but they're interesting to, to study in terms of stability. Okay, so, but we can think of, of this uh, more generally. And so we go back to thinking of just a general map from the circle, from position to the circle to a future position on the circle. We're gonna do this in mod one arithmetic to enforce that we stay on the circle. And we're gonna allow ourselves to project that out in some way, right? So if you want a sinusoidal projection, some, some orthogonal projection that gives us the interval, then we get back to, the, to something like a time series. And um, what I did a couple of years ago it's just go through the established sound synthesis algorithms that are oscillatory and reformulate them in this discrete dynamical system language. 
And um, as said, like just the standard sine oscillator is uh, stepping con with constant uh, speed on the circle and projecting out by a sign, right? Frequency modulation uh, is one of the most successful sound synthesis uh, methods, the most earningest or one of the most earningest patents by Stanford University um, is a, a sinusoidal oscillator that's perturbed by a separate independent oscillator over here. And I can't draw as uh, Teresa correctly found out. Um, and there are many more like this. And I, you know, most of this is not interesting to you, but one thing to realize is of course, we can sort of immediately see that these projections are in, indeed completely independent of the dynamical process. Right, and um, this is this stuff here on the right that's stepping on the circle. And one property that I, I want to sort of emphasize is we have picked a domain now and we do arithmetic on that domain, but because it's mod one, this is actually unconditionally stable. We cannot blow this up. This is not gonna numerically do bad things for us. No matter what we do on the circle, it's gonna stay on the circle. Uh, this property, this seems to be a bit of a hyperventilation, but I think it's really important. This property, I, I like to call this topological stability, right? Because we pick a, if you will, a sort of a, a compact domain, it cannot shoot into non-compact spaces, right? So we're gonna stay where we are. And that's a good property numerically. I can give this to an undergrad to implement. And as long as they have the mod, mod one in there, it's not gonna blow up on them. And they can experiment and do crazy things. So that's actually a good sort of little topological property that we want from our chaotic oscillators. And you see a lot of these oscillators can be chaotic if you drive them into certain parameter ranges. You will find in the chaos literature maps that are not like that, where you can pick parameters where they blow up on you. So part of the reason why I started studying these maps is I wanted sort of well-behaved, good property, uh, chaotic systems. And this is sort of for topological reason, a good uh, dynamical system. Um, but we don't have to stop there, right? There's nothing saying that we have to work with hard embedded circle in the Euclidean plane. We now have a, a, a interval parameterization that maybe even that we could reparameterize, but we can also use that to deform things and play with embedding or, or even uh, worse behaved things. In fact, in this picture, you already see like this example here is not even an embedding, but I have some, some nice crossing here. And so let's actually see how that works in, in real life. So the way to look at that picture is, this is our output. This oscillator is actually gonna project on an audio sample like this. and this oscillator here, and I won't be able to draw the whole thing, maybe oh, I'm fine, uh, also projects down, but the result is a perturbation onto that oscillator. And um, this is done by a, a cubic spine algorithm, but the point is you could actually pick any sort of methods that takes as an input parameterization and maybe it's path connected, right? So this is a fairly general topological condition that you need to meet and you can do this construction. If you don't like this spline, you like something else, go ahead, right? This is just to illustrate the principle. So let's make some noise. So you should hear a sine oscillator. This is just boring. This is just this left guy making sound, but I can actually deform this guy, right? So you should hear some richness in timbre happening. And you see, this is not even embedding, but right? so the way our spline renders in the plane is gonna be intersections and so forth, but it's fine. Our underlying topology, like our parameterization that goes on this space is a circle, so we're fine. And I can then do FM, so I can just crank up my... Okay, here's, here's a good one. And um, this is already more interesting auditorily. Okay. But I can, of course, you know, deform this guy as well. I can grab him here. No, not like this. Right, and you can see there's also degeneracy as a projection, but the underlying thing is, um, is a circle. Okay, uh, just a quick uh, noise thing. Um, I can make this a nonlinear oscillator. This is not the Arnold map and crank up uh, the nonlinearity. And now I have a chaotic oscillator here. 
and it's sort of unpleasant so I don't want to play this too long but the point is that this is unconditionally stable like so I can do all the crazy things and just by having picked the right topology I can play with this and don't have to worry that anything is going to be ill behaved in terms of the algorithm right okay um this is just uh, sort of a modern version of the, the, the stability pictures that Arnold has rendered now under these deformations, right? Because for topological reasons, we know can do this. We can study what happens when we do these kind of more radical deformations. And, you know, I don't, this is not what this is about, but you find that, you know, certain features like these Arnold tongues are robust under even these kind of deformations and projections. Uh, but you do get sort of interesting new phenomena like this, skew symmetry that is captured in in uh, non-symmetric shapes that we are we're going to use and so forth um so i i sent you down the road of chaos and let's come back to sanity because you know non-linear mathematics is messy and complicated and we don't want to be there too long so let's go back to happy land and happy land in in, in digital audio is linear time invariant filter theory and the picture that you see here is um, um, comes out of the work of Stieglitz, who has sort of promoted the idea that really this picture essentially encapsulates this theory. And I think that's true, but I, I won't have time to really fully explain this. I just want to use this picture uh, to talk topology, and it's a beautifully topological picture if you if you get why I'm saying this. But first of all, over here. You know, we circle, you know, this is, and but also down here, it has this weird, like discrete pattern circles going on. So this diagram comes out of uh, uh, the digital revolution, but before the computers, we had electronics, but it was analog, right? You had a radio, you had an actual potentiometer you dialed around, and we built filters because we needed them for radio to work. So there was an analog filter theory and uh, the two domains between time and frequency was uh, the real line in both of them, right? So uh, Stiglitz studied this using uh, Hilbert spaces, but there's actually a topological theory for this. Um, comes out of work by Pontryagin. And these Fourier relationships in this context are ca called Pontryagin duality. Um, and the objects that all the things on this diagram have, have to have in this theory are locally, I'll have to write over here, locally compact abelian group structure and Hausdorff is usually implied and people don't write it down. Um, but I'm gonna actually keep writing in exemplars that we're very familiar with that end up being locally compact um, abelian groups. Like so R with addition, just going to write it for this one case, is an example of a locally compact abelian group. It's not compact because R shoots off to infinity, and um, and so that's not a compact space. Um, for a signal processing person, the step we're doing is sampling. What we have to take discrete samples to store them in the computer. So this is what's happening here. So if you think of this down here as uh, the integers over the over addition, then the integers are a subgroup of the reals, right? So this is a, a taking a subgroup process, or if you want to think of the inverse, there's sort of an embedding of the integers back into the, the reals. And Pontryagin duality tells us that actually we get this object over here. And I'm just going to sort of hand wave and say, tell you like, this is actually the quotient of our mod C, right? So this is a sort of a, a quotient compactification of what we have up here. So sampling in the time domain here is quotient taking in the frequency domain. And the engineering term for the effect that this quotient taking has is aliasing. You may know this if you watch a Hollywood movie with old spike wheels that tend to turn backwards in certain conditions. Um, this is when our sampling doesn't have the correct resolution to resolve a, a periodic phenomena. Uh, we get artifacts that are not actually the correct thing. Our eyes also have a rate, so we we ourselves can create this phenomenon. Um, we can keep going here, right? So what is happening here, if we compactify this, uh, the integers, we get something like Z mod NC, if there's N points here. Um, 
And in the in the Fourier domain, we also get C mod N C, but they just come about as different things. Here it would be a discretization, a subgroup of the quotient group. And on the on the left side, it is um, a quotient taking, right? And uh, the, the theory of Pontryagin tells us we can always go back and forth between the two and recover the other thing. So if you have, have a, a compact um, group here, like here, you will always get a discrete group over here and conversely. And this is interesting because it, it tells us how sampling relates to frequency effects. And it's in a sense topological. Right, so uh, a, a survey hand wave intuition, right? So you have a racetrack. Racetracks don't have to be circles. They can just be weird loops. They can even have bridges and so forth. But you can measure how many laps a car took with just the sensor, right? And if the sensor doesn't measure often enough, you may miss a car passing, right? So th this is a, a notion of aliasing. And so you can get this alien sort of independent of the shape of your of your loop, right? It's a it's an actual a topological effect, even though usually in signal processing, it's not explained as that. So uh, you see again that there's sort of topology hidden sort of in plain sight in these theories. Um, so it turns out that at least for sort of mathematical reason, there's actually eight domains that we ought to consider because we can start with, uh, aliasing first and sampling second or the other way around. So this middle layer here, uh, there's a choice in what we do first. And I actually want to get to a filter construction through a physical example. And you already see on the right side annotated, there's a mention of strings. And we here I really have sort of in mind a physical string, say, of a guitar. But it turns out that's actually the same as the waves in an air pipe. So this will also capture things like trumpets and so forth. Um, the original theory already had proposed two structures. In fact, before the wave equation ever was written down, Bernoulli proposed that the way to uh, describe the solution is by a discrete sum of sinusoids. Um, and D'Alembert proposed, no, 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 I, I think that the, the, the right solution is in terms of left and right traveling waves. Um, and if you just take into consideration boundary conditions, um, here's a boundary condition on our domain. So at the domain boundary, we're going to say we want to have, say, no deflection. Right, and it's, it's straightforward to then fill in this. What should happen? We know the sum of left and right traveling waves is the solution. And for some reason, this is really misbehaving here. All right, I'm just going to do it again. F x minus c t plus f x plus c t equals zero. So that just means you get the sign inversion. Anyway, I'm just gonna. Uh, not fight the system. Um, and with that, we end up getting essentially this picture, right? Uh, our solutions travel back and forth on the domain of the string in the D'Alembert picture, and they are discrete points in the frequency domain in the Bernoulli picture. And so the proposed solutions actually already captured this topology that they at the time had no idea about. Um, and it turns out, filling in some technicalities, and I've sort of indicated some of that over here, with Schwartz's theory of distribution, we essentially understand everything that these two understand here. There's another set of uh, laws called Werner laws, very simple old um, trigonometric identities that allow you to convert multiplications into additions. Uh, you can actually go from the Fourier picture over here, even into a Fourier de uh, decomposition in the traveling wave. And so we just, whatever, wherever we want to do whatever, we know how to do it. So we have a very, very comfortable uh, situation in one dimensions. And this is important because there's another thing that sort of happened. Um, um, it was known that you can model things uh, following traveling waves, even uh, back in the 60s, this was done. But uh, in, the, in the 80s, it was discovered, really, we should think of that as being a very good way to simulate the wave equation. Because it turns out, like down here, I said this was Z mod NZ. So this is just a cyclic group. You can model shifts on cyclic groups in order of one. 
Okay, so this is a sublinear algorithm for simulating the wave equation. And it doesn't matter how big your cyclic group is because this is order one. We have an N here, but it doesn't matter how big N is, right? This, this may seem unintuitive, but all we're doing is we're shifting. So you just have to keep track where your shift position is. And so you only update locations indices in the circular buffer to compute delays, specifically circular delays. And it turns out that this is a treasure trove to do simulations because as long as you can localize all other effects, the only local computation you keep your O of one simulation. And for real-time audio, if you have a synthesizer, you don't want to sit there, hit the button, wait for five seconds, and then it makes a sound. Like that's not good for live performance. You need it to be in real time. So we need to be do, able to do 88,000 samples a second to do real time. So we need these hyper-fast algorithms. And this is, this is why this down corner here is so cool for us. And in a way you can see, it's just straight up sampling of the D'Alembert solution here, just in this picture. Okay, so, but we can think topologically more about this. And this is, I'm gonna be rapid here in terms of my argumentation. But so on, on the top, you see an impulse that we sent to the wave equation. And this is actually a correct solution for the AMDA wave equation for a certain type of excitation. Um, and just sort of for fun, I've glued these uh, reflection points together and did sort of a singularity resolution. I pulled this apart into a circle and you can now see that all motions are smooth and forward. There's no reflection uh, visible anymore in this except for the state of that impulse, right? It bounces from up to down at each reflection point. Now, this top picture is still very much a straight up linear wave, wave equation, constant traveling speed, and so forth. So this is this is a, a, a sort of a hard metric version of the wave equation. And so the, 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 the step that we're gonna take here is we're gonna go from up here to this picture. And the way you should think about this is observe the state that uh, the arrow is in. Like you can see that the green arrow is on the top. Um, uh, at the top part of the, 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 the circle and he's pointing down at the bottom part. Whereas the blue arrow is doing the opposite. It's actually the bottom uh, at the top part of the circle and it's on the top or the bottom part of the circle, right? So what we have actually done, we sort of encoded just the state, like what is the sign of our impulse in a sort of a double cover picture, right? And this is, uh, you should understand this as a, a, a removal of information. But we, we just say the sign has to stay this way. This, actually, this picture is actually valid even if the thing would spread, even if the amplitude would, would decay. As long as the sign doesn't flip, this, these pictures stay valid, right? And so we can have a more topological argument because we no longer make a lot of metric assumptions in these kind of pictures. You could probably do this with vibration arguments or more technical arguments, but so this is sort of a quick way to get to these kind of pictures. And so now we can actually draw these pictures for different boundary conditions, right? So the, the, the clamped string condition we have already done here, this thing would uh, be a string instrument like a guitar or violin. Um, the Neumann condition has no sign reflections at the end. So the sign, sign stays the same. This is a flute, a trumpet, okay? And, or uh, yeah. All right, so I won't be able to write this down. The, the right side picture, like the, the middle part is also an open organ pipe. The right side picture would be a reed instrument. It turns out that there's reed, the, the wood pieces in the reed instrument, as a first approximation, they're closed. So on one end, they have a closed reflection and on the open end of the clarinet, they have an open reflection, or you can take an organ pipe and cap it on one end. And then you get also an open closed configuration. Now, it's known for organ pipes that if you want to do really, really low frequency organ pipes, you have to cap them because it gets you an octave down. And we can actually visually see this here, right? Uh, for us topologists, well, oh, this is just the double cover of a Mobius strip. But we, by inspection, know this is just the same cover as we get from the rim of a Mobius band. And I may not be able to draw this, but you can observe that... Uh, the, the, the very property of the double covers, we have to go around twice to complete the full circle, right? And whereas in the other domains, we only have to go around once, right? So this literally topologically and captures what we know about organ pipes, that this is, takes twice as long to go to a cap pipe than it goes to a non-cap pipe. 
But the nice thing about that argument is this is not now not based on some deep metric argument, right? As long as this is the right topology, it will have this property, right? So we have sort of loosened this and we use this in music all the time. We have, uh, we have horns, we have connective shapes, we have this, these waveguide properties. As long as it doesn't scatter, we're good. Right, and this is true, and we know this that it doesn't matter how long the pipe are, if you cap it, it's gonna double it. it, doesn't matter if you cone it, and so forth. So, this is again sort of a topological way to talk about phenomena, and it's more general. It actually captures things where we may not even have exact solutions. Okay. So, what about two dimensional stuff? Right, so I, I had a easy life now, I was in super low dimensional space, um, and the 2D wave equation was written down pretty soon after Adalambert wrote on the 1D wave equation. And already Euler said, look, I can't really solve this, uh, which was rare for Euler. Like he felt he could solve everything. Um, and this slide, uh, you know, I have a lot of names on there. And the, the big insult about this slide is there is many, many more names that need to be on there. And the point is that we actually don't know a lot of things about 2D wave equations in sort of a strict sense. Um, we don't actually, see if I can write over there, we don't actually, know the exact position of the zeros of the Bessel function that is in this picture. The Bessel are the radial shapes of drum heads and they're not really sinusoidal. They are complicated deformations of it. And over here, while you have a step function, so there's gonna be a sharp wave front in 2D, we have some schmutz down here, a wake. So there's a non-trivial solution everywhere inside our propagation um, space. And that complicates things. And this was known before Tedon, but Tedon proved that in general, we have this phenomena that in all dimensions, sort of semi roughly speaking, impulses and steps stay impulses and steps. And in even dimensions, they don't. They will smear over and have this one over square root type function shape to them. And there's been different ways to get at the same insight. Petrovsky and Ati about guarding um sort of formulated that as a lac lacunary condition but it's essentially saying this um we have a hard time with geometric shapes we now know that there are uh 2d shapes that sound the same but it's very complicated technical constructions that get us there we don't know in general when things do or do not sound the same there's still a lot of work to be done there and i just want to go at one uh, situation, uh, which seems to be the simplest, but to take, we have a lot of circular drum heads. That's actually the drum heads we have. And so the left picture is a modeling directly um, wave propagation, at least in the case of my simulation. I don't fully know about the, the, the other papers, but um, uh, they have pictures that look like this. So it, essentially they capture this essence. By the way, Berglund has a whole catalog of beautiful renderings of all sorts of stuff. Um, so uh, there's a lot more to out there than, than what I'm showing you. But the point about that picture is the right simulation is actually a Sturm Liville theory based um, eigen uh, decomposition of the wave equation. So this is really the Bernoulli picture, and the left is really the D'Alembert picture. And we actually don't know the exact correspondence between these pictures. But from the picture alone, you already see that they're related. But right? there's no, there's no like, you get wave fronts in the right picture, even though it's not strictly localized, they don't fully know where they are. And we get the, the correct shapes on the left, even though we have thrown out some information like the wake information in this picture. So I just wanna play with this a little bit, just to give you a little bit more sense, because I haven't said uh, the word topology in a while and I need to say that word. So let's get there. Okay, so this is the drum and I can place my, my, my beater at different locations of the drum and I can say go. And so you see now a circle bouncing back and forth. And in fact, this picture is the only picture that easily relates to the 1D wave equation. But you see, if you take that section of the green line, there's two things bouncing back and forth between point-like boundaries over here and over here. So this is this section gives you actually something that we've seen in the one-dimensional case. However, if you go anywhere off axis, um, See, I, I put my, uh -huh, I just messed myself up. Okay. Um, this again. Okay. No. Anyway, I'm not going to fight it. Uh, let me slow this down. So if I go off axis, uh, there's a focusing effect here. And you can see here 
it starts folding over and create these sharp edges. So there's a caspoidal solution in the wavefront uh, for off-axis um, wavefronts. You can show that it's for all of them. I'm not gonna do that. Um, and if you go for a while, you can see here they actually resolve and they disappear again. So there's a sort of a ballet of forming of singularities of a, of a curve um, that happens as part of the dynamics of two-dimensional wave equations. And the topology that I just want to sort of mention here is people study this as a topological phenomena in cont contact topology. And these are the what's called the Legendrian front projections of our contact topology. And you can study this as not. So you can actually observe in this picture as you have it right now, this is a closed loop. This is a closed curve. Right, so in, in in knot theory we have closed curves, but they live funnily in three D space, and we want to know if we can unknot them or not. Um, but the special thing about Legendrian knots is that there's a Riemannian move that looks like this. Right, so we have two sharp curves, and we allow a resolution to just a straight line. And the justification for this we just saw in the simulation. Right, we see that pairs of cusps form. And we see the pair of cusps can resolve, right? Um, and that's captured in this Legendrian Reitemeister move. So pair cusp formation is not creating an odd condition, is what that says, right? So where does this come from? Well, let me just see if I can show you this. Uh, so what I've done now is I've shown the underlying path directions that render the wavefronts. And um, so there's a direction of propagation and there's a distance how far something propagated and the distance connections are the wavefront. So there's a sort of a correspondence between how things propagate and what is propagated. But you can take a piece of paper and let's try to draw this. And on that piece of paper, you have a, a line, but it's gonna start moving towards uh, a fold that exists. So let's, let's see, my drawing skills are gonna be challenged here. Uh, so we have uh, a surface that folded over itself like this. And when this line gets to this cusp, let's draw this in another color, it's gonna have to follow this surface. So there's this line down here to this point, it's gonna follow on the top and then cross down here. This is exactly what you see here, right? So there are singularities in the propagation surface. This, by the way, is the symplectic geometry. It's a Lagrangian submanifold in symplectic geometry. So these two things go together and they explain the dynamic of these wave propagations and they can be studied topologically. Now, sadly, I have to admit like this thing actually is an unknot. Like it's about as boring as you can get topologically because like the proof is so simple that I'll just show it. We started with a circle. Right, and all the moves that happen are randomized moves, so it's an unknot, no matter how far you go. Okay, um, I am technically at the end of my time. If I, I have maybe a minute left, let me let me try to do this quickly. I think it's interesting. So we have done now different things. We have done oscillators. We have done wave equations in their simulation. Um, Finally, I want to talk about sheaves uh, over simplicial complexes. And I'm going to rush this slide. Most of you know what the simplicial complex is. Uh, and I'm, in fact, going to talk about perhaps the most simple simplicial complex out there, which is just a line complex, alternation of points and lines like this, right? And we have our co-phase operator on there. So we have a way to navigate that, that thing. And now we construct a sheaf. And the sheaf really, for, for, for if you know just a little bit of mathematics, you should think of this on the, I can't write it on this side, so I'm gonna write it over here. Um, it's just a functor, okay? So we have a category of um, simplicial sets down here, if you will. And we have some other category as yes, unspecified that we associate with it. And because the, 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 the functor thing requires that we sort of copy our maps up, the, the map structure of our simplicial connectivity will push be pushed into that other has to be represented in the other category, right? And the the way I got to this 
is through Michael Robertson's work on topological filters. So Michael Robertson proposed that you can uh, incorporate uh, filter theory uh, in this setting by taking this general structure, but right? this is still an abstract category without anything else defined, but he gives it this substructure where you have an input chief, you have a state chief and you have an output chief. And then we just, oops, <laughs> we follow um, our chief rules that we have to fill in all the morphisms and we get a, a, a picture like this. And he showed that we can place linear digital filter theory that we already discussed a little bit now over this simplicial complex. And in fact, he, he sort of did the forward part this piece, and I, I filled in the, the feedback part, but it, that wasn't the hard part. Uh, he really deserves credit here. Um, and that's just linear algebra. So we have a sheaf structure of vector spaces um, that look like this. And um, this is just the size of a digital filter. This is just an input audio sample. This is an output audio sample. And here we just have our propagation of computation. Uh, happening, and we can just rewrite our uh, classical linear time and when the filter theory this way. And you can easily see that this part here is just an index shift to this part, right? Uh, one is assigned to zero, two is assigned to one. So this, is a, this is just a shift, and this is just computing a feedback into the new sample. Um, these are just copying data around, and this is an output that computes a forward filter. So this is really just rewritten linear time invariant filter theory, but it's now lives over topological space. So whatever crazy thing we want to do with our topological space, you can filter on it. And it has the same stability and construction criteria of our classical filter theory. So this is an incredibly flexible way of thinking about filters. Uh, and one last thing to say about this is, this is linear algebra. So we could immediately jump to cohomology theory. We could do chief cohomology here if we wanted to. Uh, but I sort of, I'm now saying I, for some things I don't want to. Like here's an example of where I don't want to do cohomology theory. Uh, we did circle maps. We did these crazy chaotic oscillators. We can actually do this construction with these crazy chaotic oscillators. We just have to be um, categories, which is not a very, tight restriction. We need to be composing maps and we can compose our maps. So these are the circle maps that we discussed and we can also place these in the sheaf structure. So for my applied friends, I say, look, you can actually attach local algorithms to a topological space with sheaf construction as long as you're careful how you do your maps. So let's uh, find like, a chance to hear some noise. Uh, the first example is a plucked string algorithm, the way I discussed it, on a, a torus with a top projection for metrization. If that it was too fast, ask me a question about it. So you can hear a wildly deformed plucked string here. Okay. The middle one is just a, a little filter that models harmonic oscillator. It should just be one frequency. Okay. So there's actually some schmutz in there. This schmutz is auditory aliasing. I've left it in there so you actually get an example of this. And the final one is uh, frequency modulation. This is a nonlinear oscillator with inharmonic partials, just so I can show that it doesn't matter if, uh, if, if you think of this as linear or not. Um, and I'm over time, so I am going to say thank you right here. Thank you very much. So let's please all unmute ourselves so that we can clap together for our speaker. So I actually do see a question by David in chat. I'm sorry, I, I missed this earlier, David. Sorry, I also missed it and then it yeah. was too late to, <laughs> to go back to it. Um, yeah, uh, so do, do, you, do you want to unmute yourself or I can just try to answer? I'm, I'm not quite sure I fully understand is the propagation of wave also bounded? Let me actually go back to the slide and maybe we can, um, yeah. oops, <laughs> okay. Um, so we have this slide where we have different, I assume you're referring to this slide here, something along those lines. Um, no, I'll, yeah. I, I was referring to the circle representation where you had the waves, no. Um, the the two-dimensional one, this? 
Yeah, the two D wave. Yeah. It's disbounded. Um, depends on what one. exactly you mean by bounded. But so let me uh, let me give you one answer. Maybe you can correct me if I got this wrong. Like there's actually a recent result by Colin uh, de Verrier and Vicente that showed that the length of this um, wave front grows without bounds. It will literally grow uh, even though it's on this compact domain. Um, but I don't know if that's what you meant by bounded. If I, I wanted to know if the waves are kind of finite within the circle, that uh, the propagation of the waves don't move or they don't exceed the circle. Because, okay, uh, so they, in, in, in this simulation that I do here, uh, the, this I don't allow this point to go outside here in this simulation. Now, you could though, you could render things where you treat that circle as kind of a scattering object, a wave comes from outside and scatters against against the circle. But in my simulation, I'm, I'm interested in drums, where drums are bounded. And, um, and so all my excitations are inside, if that, if that makes sense. That clarifies it, because yeah. I was looking at it in terms of other uh, waves. So yeah, I think absolutely. And people it. study the inverse. They study scattering by these objects. Um, yeah. Great. Does anyone else have a question? Yeah, I, I have one. Uh, hi, great talk. Um, Thank you. I was I was actually one of Michael Robinson's students, so I was excited to see this talk. But the uh, um, yeah, I was wondering what kind of open questions you have, like in this area, that like you think mathematicians could help assist with. Uh, and then I, I guess I have a follow up as well, but I'll, I'll let you answer that first. So the, 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 this is a very good question, but also a very horrible question because the correct answer is that I have multiple lifetimes worth of answers, uh, of questions that uh, need answers. Like I want to know where the exact zeros of the Bessel functions are. I do want to know that. This would tremendously help me. I, I don't. I suspect that's not what you were uh, thinking about, though. But maybe in the realm of topology. Right. Yeah, um, specifically like this kind of audience. Yeah. But let's let's, let's talk about sheaves, right? I think a, a, a two-dimensional simplicial sheaf theory that goes into a lot of detail about all the things that can happen there uh, would be tremendous. I have actually started writing. I've written one paper that did some very special example of that problem. Um, uh, in a way, this talk, I'm, I'm trying to hint that, like, if you do one dimensional things, things are very easy. The moment you go into higher dimensional spaces, you get all sorts of effects that are come out of complication in geometry and dimension theory. And we need a simplicial version of this that actually drills down uh, and that deals with it. And another way to think about this is we, we have a lot of very great math that deals with manifold and smooth structures and so forth. We need a good sampling theory of these structures, right? How yeah. do point clouds relate to these things? And persistence gets at that in some, uh, some, uh, some way also, right? So there's a related thing. And the final thing, if I just may throw at you stuff is, I would love to understand uh, in detail the relationship between persistent homology and harmonic analysis. Um, so, and that, you know, I leave it that vague, but there's a lot of detail that one could mention to even flesh that out. So there, there's a lots of open questions. I think in, 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 in applied topology, we're really still in an early stage of a lot of questions. There's a lot of very rich things to do. And if you want to talk in, uh, uh, more in personally, contact me and we can chat and I can throw crazy problems at you and you will hate my life. Yeah. 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 No, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I've wondered things about the, the third one for a long time, but your talk made me think about the second one that you mentioned. I was wondering, have you tried doing like a simplicial approximation of the drum head and then using Robinson's like sheaf filter construction to do like uh, LTR filters on uh, um, on the drum head and, and see how that works or like, no, I've curious. written a paper that's preparatory for this. So I've, I've gotcha. I specified a directional two-dimensional simplex with filters on top of it. And the gotcha. idea is that that's a building block for this. The, the part of the problem is like you saw these sharp edges yeah. that form in the wavefront. Technically, we have to resolve them and we have to keep track of them. And so this is a, an intricate question of bookkeeping. 
right? Ultimately. Mm -hmm. And right. I, I think you can do interesting stuff there. And sort of, it, it's sort of a next thing that I'm interested. If you want to talk to me more about this, I'd love to talk to you about this. But yeah, yeah, yeah this is where it's going. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 I could shoot you an email. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful question. You know, I, I I could talk forever for this question alone. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Maybe I will go with one and in the meantime, people can think if they have more questions. Um, quite in the beginning of your talk where you talked about um, projecting the circle with, I forgot if it was cosine or sine, and then mm -hmm. talking about that you could also deform the circle and you showed us how you moved around right. the circle in the sound chain. I just wanted to make sure that I said correctly that it's just a projection, um, like where you squish things down. Um, right. So, deforming the circle. so in this picture here, I have chosen, and this is actually a choice. Like this is not a, in a way, my argument says you should not like think of this in this hard term. The reason why I chose this orthogonal projection is just to help our visual intuition. But yeah. we're good at thinking about these kind of geometric projections, right? But this could be any projection function. This could be a really awkward, horrible, compressing. It could be some other fu projection function. I just chose these so that we we stay in some intuitive land uh, out there. But the one that I chose are the one that I've drawn here. These are orthogonal projections down uh, from this shape. Like you have, uh, you walk around the shape parametrized. Wherever you are at that point, we're going to project down on this line. By the way, I'm just going to do a quick demo of, of this just for fun. Because what I haven't, um, haven't actually said, right? Um, because of this projection, and the nature of this parametrization on this particular spine, when I do this, nothing happens, right? It's because this spline parametrization is actually per dimension. They're actually separable. It's not a universal property. You can have splines where you don't, you cannot separate out your parametrization. But in the one that I picked, like this actually doesn't do anything. I can deal, I can do my performance gestures just for fun. Mathematically, it actually doesn't do anything. It's a consequence of this projection. If you picked another projection, that would mix in, and you would no longer, no longer get these kind of separations. And I actually think that's part of the playing ground. But right? we have the freedom to pick any projection here. If you want to get something else, pick another projection, right? Um, so this is a very good question. And in, in general, to go back to the uh, previous question. Like I think, for from a applied perspective, thinking more about what uh, putting things into a space and what the freedoms are when you do this sort of embedding theory, immersion theory, but from sort of an applied perspective, what, what happens to me when I embed it in this higher space and then project down to all sorts of different projections? All of this is of interest because all of these has consequences that we can exploit. And I just picked a very boring one here. Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, maybe one last question before we end the recording. Yeah, or maybe everyone already asked their questions. Then let me end the recording here. Thank you again. All right, well, thank you for having